Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation on the Research and Development Tax Incentive. Hopefully, everybody is in a buoyant mood with the holiday season fast approaching. And for those in Melbourne, at least, restrictions are slowly but surely lifting as the weather improves. My name is Ali Suleiman, and I am one of the tax advisory partners at Pitcher Partners in Melbourne, with a particular specialisation in the Research and Development Tax Incentive, as well as specialisations in corporate and employment taxes. Now, it probably goes without saying, but I thought I would point out that we'll be using the shorthand acronym R&D to refer to the term research and development many times during this presentation. Today's presentation will be conducted by two of our leaders of the R&D practice. Maria Paradisis, a client director in our tax advisory team, who has an impressive resume in dealing with R&D claims of clients and conducting and managing ATO reviews of R&D claims that do arise. And notwithstanding the slight pause in the COVID COVID world, the R&D reviews do still occur and we still expect them to occur uh, in the foreseeable future. Maria also is able to share her considerable corporate tax experience and a not-for-profit experience with clients uh, as she deals with them on their R&D matters. Today, Maria will be joined by Janet O'Shamp, one of our newer R&D team members, who will also be presenting today. And Janet comes to us with significant recent experience in R&D claims from Deloitte and also the Export Market Development Grant. So it'll be great to hear from both Maria and Janet during the course of the presentation today. In terms of some usual but important housekeeping, we do have some general disclaimers, which, is in, which it is important that I highlight to you. In brief, that the presentation today is general in nature and not tailored to your specific needs and is based on the laws as they stand today. I will leave you to peruse the finer details of this slide in your own time, but please, uh, it is important that I point it out. Given there is significant material to cover in our allotted time today, I'll move straight on to our agenda. Firstly, we'll be providing an initial overview of the benefit of the R&D tax incentive to clients and, and the two-tiered structure in terms of how that benefit is provided. We'll also discuss some of the eligibility requirements associated with the R&D incentive and the process for making a claim. Noting that the federal government has released the much awaited 2020 budget in the midst of this unfortunate pandemic um, and its views to re-stimulate the economy and create jobs, we can talk about some of the welcome changes to the R&D rules. Some of you may recall that prior to COVID, uh, prior to the pandemic hitting, R&D was being wound back considerably and there was much criticism from industry and the profession about the signals that this was sending. In a welcome change, the 2020 budget has reversed much of that negativity and the wind back. We'll move on to discuss uh, overseas R&D claims. And th these are situations which involve either an overseas owner of the relevant R&D IP bringing the R&D activities onshore to Australia, or an Australian owned uh, R&D company owning the IP, which needs to take its activities offshore to further uh, the relevant R&D activities. And finally, we'll conclude with a discussion on the continued importance of record keeping and governance, uh, particularly as the government will ensure that it collects every last cent uh, to, to support its purse lines as, as we try to recover uh, from the spending during the pandemic. As a matter of final housekeeping, and given the length of the session today, we would ask you to record your questions and please feel free to email them to us either through your usual Pitcher Partners contact or through our details, which we will supply during the course of this presentation or towards the conclusion of this presentation. So without further ado, I pass over to Maria to discuss the relevant benefit to R&D claimants. Thank you, Ali. As Ali mentioned, we will now be looking at the benefit that is available to claimants under the R&D tax incentive scheme. The R&D tax incentive is provided to eligible entities in two manners, the first being a refundable offset and the second being a non-refundable offset. As Ali previously discussed, following on from the current year's federal budget, changes have been introduced that impact the R&D tax incentive rate from the 1st of July 2021. The rates currently outlined on this slide represent the applicable rates for FY20 and FY21. The refundable offset is available to entities who have an aggregated turnover of less than 20 million. The concept of aggregated turnover largely encompasses the turnover of the R&D entity, its affiliates, and entities connected with the R&D entity. This concept looks at control 
and requires you to group the turnover of entities that are largely controlled by one another or are controlled by the same third party. This assessment is required to be performed on an annual basis. As the name suggests, the refundable offset can result in cash being refunded to the entity. However, this is ultimately dependent upon whether or not the entity has a tax liability owing when incorporating the R&D tax incentive in its tax return. The applicable offset rate is currently 43.5%, which provides eligible entities with a benefit of either 16% or 17.5%. I will be discussing how this benefit is derived in the following slide. For all other entities, the applicable offset is a non-refundable offset. The offset in this instance cannot be provided to the entity as cash, however, it is available to be carried forward for future utilisation. The offset's future utilisation is dependent upon the entity satisfying the loss recruitment provisions. The non-refundable offset rate is currently 38.5%, which provides eligible entities with the benefit of either 8.5% or 11%. Currently, the R&D tax offset is only available on expenditure up to $100 million per annum. However, this amount has been increased to $150 million from FY22. The objective of the slide is to outline what benefit entities receive as a result of claiming the R&D tax incentive. It is important to note from the outset that the entity making the R&D claim is not permitted to receive a double benefit stemming from the incentive. This means that no tax deduction is available for those expenses notionally allocated to the R&D tax incentive. Accordingly, the pure benefit, or in other words, uplift, available to entities is the difference between the applicable offset rate and their corporate tax rate. The reason being is that a tax deduction would ordinarily have been available to the entity should they have opted to not make an R&D tax incentive claim. In the first column, the entity has a turnover of less than 20 million, which means that they are eligible for the refundable tax offset at the rate of 43.5%. Taking into account the entity's net profit and eligible expenditure, the entity has a taxable income amount of $1 million. After having treated the R&D expenditure of $800,000 as non-deductible, applying the tax rate of 27.5%, the entity has a tax liability in the first instance of $275,000. The R&D tax incentive amount has been calculated as $348,000, which is $800,000 times the rate of 43.5%. Applying the incentive amount of $348,000 against a tax liability of $275,000, the entity will be due a refund of $73,000 upon lodgement of their income tax return. In column two, the entity falls within the non-refundable offset category as their aggregated turnover is greater than $20 million. Taking into account their taxable income and applicable tax rate, the entity has a tax liability of $6,300,000. The entity's R&D tax incentive amount equates to $308,000, which is 800,000 times the rate of 38.5%. Applying the R&D tax incentive amount against the entity's tax liability, the entity is now only required to pay $5,992,000. In column three, we have modeled the same net profit and taxable income as column two, However, in this scenario, the entity does not make a R&D tax incentive claim. Accordingly, in this scenario, the entity is required to pay $6,060,000 in tax. It is important to note that in some instances and in accordance with their applicable accounting standards, entities capitalize their R&D spend on the balance sheet. In this instance, there is no requirement to treat as non-deductible the R&D expenditure capitalized in the current year. However, any amortization that is recorded from that point onwards will continue to be treated as non-deductible. As it is clearly outlined in the slide, there is a benefit available to claimants who put through an R&D tax incentive claim. The R&D tax incentive regime is regulated by two government bodies, Oz Industry and the Australian Taxation Office. Oz Industry regulates the technical merits of the R&D tax incentive regime and the ATO is responsible for regulating the quantum of the expenditure notionally allocated to the R&D tax incentive. Entities who are looking to make an R&D tax incentive claim are required to prepare and lodge an annual application with Oz Industry 10 months post their year end. 
For example, an entity with a 30 gin year end will have until April in the following year to lodge their application with Oz Industry. This is the first step of making an R&D claim as all activities must be registered before any expenditure can be notionally allocated to them for the purpose of the R&D tax incentive. Oz Industry does not review the annual application submitted as the lodgement process is performed on a self-assessment basis. However, Oz Industry, like the ATO, can review applications as part of a formal review process. Likewise, the quantum of the R&D tax incentive amount is made on a self-assessment basis as it forms part of the company's income tax return. The ATO, of course, can select taxpayers for a formal review or audit. It is important to highlight that both regulators expect that the R&D claimant appropriately documents the R&D activities. Oz industry requires the claimant to substantiate and document the technical merits, whilst the ATO requires the claimant to substantiate and support the allocation of expenditure to the R&D tax incentive. Both regulators expect that the documentation is contemporaneous and is available at the time the claim is made. Janet will be discussing in greater detail the governance and record keeping requirements expected by both regulators. During this part of the presentation, I will be discussing the technical requirements that an entity must satisfy before it is able to make an R&D tax incentive claim. It is important to note that these requirements must be met on an annual basis. The first requirement I will discuss is regarding the structure of the entity. The entity must be a body corporate, i.e. a company, as the incentive is not available to individuals, trusts or not-for-profit entities. The entities must be an Australian resident. However, a foreign resident entity that is carrying on a business in Australia via a permanent establishment is also eligible to claim the incentive. The incentive is also available to public trading trusts. This is on the basis that an entity of this type is taxed like a company. Secondly, in order to make a R&D tax incentive claim, the entity must have spent a minimum of $20,000 per year. There is no ability to carry forward expenditure previously incurred on R&D activities and the expenditure must have been incurred in the relevant income year. There are additional requirements that must be satisfied where the expenditure has been incurred with an associate. In this instance, the expenditure must have also been paid prior to the end of the relevant income year. Constructive payments are acceptable, i.e. by increasing a related party loan. The expenditure must also have been spent in Australia unless the overseas expenditure is minor and incidental. There are additional considerations in respect of overseas expenditure that Janet will be discussing later on in the presentation. The expenditure must also be at risk. Put simply, this means that the entity must bear both the technical and financial risk associated with the R&D activities. In terms of technical risk, the entity effectively must control the direction of the R&D project. They should have complete oversight over the performance and outcome of the R&D activities. In addition, the entity must also hold any IP arising from the conduct of the R&D activities. In terms of financial risk, the entity must not be compensated for performing the R&D activities and must bear the financial burden of performing the activities. Finally, an entity cannot deduct its expenditure on R&D activities if it conducts those activities to a significant extent for another entity. However, in some instances, co-ownership is permitted, where the owners effectively share the results of their use. A situation like this is typically agreed upon by both parties under a predetermined legal arrangement. In order to be eligible for the R&D tax incentive, the entity must have at a minimum one core R&D activity. A core R&D activity must be experimental in nature, the outcome of which cannot be known or determined in advance and must have the purpose of generating new knowledge that is not readily accessible. You may decide to conduct R&D for several reasons, however, for the activity to be an eligible core R&D activity, one of your substantial purposes to conduct the activity needs to be to generate new knowledge. This knowledge must not only be new to the entity, it must be new to the world. 
this element requires an entity to perform sufficient due diligence to satisfy itself of this requirement. The regulators expect eligible R&D entities to conduct a worldwide search for an existing manner to achieve their outcome before they commence their activities. They also expect that there are records that substantiate this search. When considering whether knowledge is readily accessible, the knowledge should not be available. This also includes information that is commercially sensitive and held by a competitor. Again, this is an annual assessment. If by year three of the R&D project, the knowledge that the entity is looking to develop exists and is readily accessible, then the entity's activities will no longer satisfy the definition of core activity. It is at this point in time where the entity can no longer make an R&D claim. When determining whether the outcome cannot be known or determined in advance, ask yourself this, would a reasonably competent professional in the industry be able to resolve the technical unknown without performing a series of experimental activities? If the answer to this question is yes, then the activity will not meet the definition of core activity. A key factor with this concept is that there must be a knowledge gap in the market. This knowledge gap needs to be more than just a technical challenge and must need a systematic progression of work before it can be resolved, if it is even possible of being resolved. Whilst commercially no one wants to see their project fail, it does not mean that failed R&D projects do not qualify for the R&D tax incentive regime. The definition of core activity extends to projects that cannot be proven. Finally, the nature of the activities must be to develop new products, new services, new materials or new devices or processes. Some examples are as follow. Developing a new product if it is a product that does not readily exist in the same form or developing a new or improved process to create an existing product or achieve some other outcome. A core R&D activity must follow a systematic progression of work that is based on principles of established science. This does not necessarily mean that the work needs to be completed in a lab. What it does require though, is that the systematic progression of work includes the following elements, hypothesis, experiments, observation, evaluation, and logical conclusions. Put simply, it must be more than trial and error. All of these elements need to be present within the activity in order for the activity to be considered a core activity. I will now discuss each of these points separately. The first step being hypothesis. This is your area or proposed explanation for how you could achieve a particular result and why that result may be or may not be achievable. The hypothesis will guide your investigation and must be developed before you commence with the activities. The hypothesis must be tested through experimentation. Experiments are a scientific procedure that are undertaken to test the hypothesis. What you observe and evaluate during your experimentation process may support your hypothesis or it may not. As briefly mentioned above, the experiments do not need to be performed in a lab. They may take place in many environments, from offices to farms to process plants. The design and details of the experiments will vary from industry to industry. However, they must aim to test a hypothesis as part of a systematic progression of work. Observation and evaluation. This step is where you observe, evaluate and record information and results that relate to the experiment. This information can be both qualitative, i.e. descriptive, and quantitative, i.e. involve numerical data. When evaluating the results, you assess and analyze what has occurred during the experimentation process. The final step requires you to draw logical conclusions about your hypothesis. The results experienced may support your theory about how to achieve your desired outcome, or they may not. Depending on the results, you may be required to reiterate the experiments or even redesign your hypothesis. It is important to note 
that the regulators expect that you retain records that demonstrate that each of the steps have been performed. When assessing whether your activity meets the definition of a core activity, it is important to note that there are several exclusions. These excluded activities, however, may be eligible supporting R&D activities, which I will be discussing further on on the next slide. Examples of excluded activities include market research, management or efficiency studies, activities associated with patenting, licensing or other commercial activities, activities that are looking to reproduce a commercial product or service, or developing, modifying or customising computer software for the dominant purpose of use by an entity for their internal administration, i.e. a payroll function. On this slide, we have a practical example of what would constitute a core R&D activity. Baking Co. is looking to develop a new bread product that contains fish oil as a source of omega-3. Their objective is that this product does not taste like fish. Prior to undertaking the R&D activity, Baking Co. conducted a worldwide search and satisfied itself that such a product did not currently exist on the worldwide market. Their research found that it was not currently possible to add fish oil to bread without leaving the bread taste like fish. Bacon Co. was looking to generate new knowledge in the form of a new product. When they commenced with their activity, there was no bread on the worldwide market that contained fish oil as a source of omega-3. Therefore, they would be generating new knowledge about how to add fish oil to bread without the bread product tasting like fish. Bacon Co. concluded that they needed to perform a series of experiments to ascertain whether or not it was possible to develop such a product. Bacon Co. formulated their hypothesis and contacted a research service provider to help them design and perform their experiments. During the experimentation process, they would produce batches of bread which were separated from their commercial baking activities. Baking Co. performed a series of experiments where they tested different baking temperatures, different mixing speeds, different mixes of grains and varying quantities of fish oil. After each experiment, Baking Co. would taste the bread product and evaluate its texture and taste. Given the amount of variables they were testing, Baking Co. was required to reiterate their experiments on a number of occasions. After several attempts, Baking Co. resolved that it was possible to develop such a product and the new knowledge that it had generated throughout the experimentation process was around the variables it had experimented with. Baking Co. now knew exactly what quantities were required how the materials needed to be mixed, what temperature the bread needed to be baked in, and how long it needed to be baked for. Baking Co. followed a systematic progression of work and at all times retained documentation that supported their activities. Therefore, Baking Co. would be eligible to claim the R&D tax incentive on its eligible expenditure. Once you have assessed that you have an eligible core R&D activity, you can assess whether you have conducted any activities that meet the definition of a supporting activity. A supporting activity does just that. It supports the conduct of the core activity. Each supporting activity identified must directly relate to at least one of the core activities. The supporting activity must be conducted for the dominant purpose of supporting the core activity. Dominant purpose in this instant means the prevailing or most influential purpose. Supporting activities can be conducted before, during or after the core activity. This means that you can conduct your supporting R&D activity in a different year to your core activity. Where your supporting activities produce goods, you must be able to show how the goods produced related to the core activity. This is regardless of the scale of manufacture. Taking the Baking Co. example we just discussed, Baking Co. would need to be able to clearly identify the bread produced as part of its R&D project and the bread it produced as part of its ordinary business activities. Some examples of supporting activities include the following. Performing a literature review to refine your hypothesis before you conduct your experiments. Performing a literature review to determine whether the new knowledge you're looking to develop already exists on a worldwide basis. Performing the following activities that are instrumental to performing a series of experiments, producing a test rig, cleaning and maintaining equipment, decommissioning and dismantling equipment, manufacturing a small batch of products. 
building a user interface that is critical to assessing whether the software developed works, managing the R&D project lifecycle, which will ensure that the project runs as intended, testing the new product, process or service in order to evaluate and draw logical conclusions. As part of the 2020-21 federal budget, the government announced changes impacting the R&D tax incentive regime. A number of these changes reversed many of the previously announced R&D measures that were introduced during the 2018-19 federal budget. Pitcher partners were involved in making several submissions to the Senate opposing these changes and we welcome these changes that were seeking to reverse many of the decisions that would have reduced the effectiveness of the R&D regime in Australia. Under the 2020 bill, companies who are entitled to the refundable R&D tax offset, the incentive will remain refundable and will provide such companies with the benefit of 18.5% above their applicable company tax rate. These companies are currently enjoying a 16% benefit for FY20 and will receive a 17.5% benefit for FY21. There is no cap on the quantum of the refund that can be, can be received by R&D claimants and these measures will come into effect from 1 July 2021. On this slide, we have provided an example which outlines what benefit claimants would receive as a result of the R&D tax incentive regime. In this example, the claimant is eligible for the refundable tax offset as their aggregated turnover for the year is less than 20 million. The claimant has also spent $2 million on eligible R&D expenditure. Applying the current offset rates, the claimant would receive a $320,000 benefit in FY20 and a $350,000 benefit in FY21. The quantum of the benefit has been determined with reference to the claimant's tax rate and the current R&D tax incentive rate of 43.5%. As we can see, the benefit is set to increase to 370,000 during FY22 and thus would provide the entity with a significant benefit stemming from the R&D tax incentive scheme. For all other R&D claimants, the benefit continues to be non-refundable. For FY20 and FY21, claimants are entitled to a R&D tax incentive rate of 38.5% and depending on their respective tax rate, the benefit will either be 8.5% or 11%. From FY22, the quantum of the incentive will be tied to the claimant's R&D intensity, which is a measure of the company's annual R&D expenditure as a proportion of its total annual expenditure. The additional R&D benefit will either be 8.5% or 16.5% above the applicable company tax rate, with the higher benefit being available where the company's R&D intensity level exceeds 2%. These offset rates are applicable for eligible expenditure up to a cap of 150 million per annum, and again come into effect from 1 July 2021. We have once again illustrated the benefit available to claimants with an example. Under this example, the entity has a turnover of greater than 20 million, has an applicable tax rate of 30% and has an R&D intensity level of 15%. The 15% intensity factor has been calculated by dividing the 75 million R&D expenditure by the total expenditure amount of 500 million. The total R&D tax incentive amount that would be applicable for FY20 is approximately 28 million. This amount has been calculated by multiplying the eligible expenditure of 75 million by the current offset rate of 43.5%. Applying the 2020 changes and determining the applicable offset per tier, the claimant's R&D tax incentive amount would amount to approximately 34 million. As you can see, the 2020 changes are geared towards rewarding those entities that spend a significant amount of expenditure on eligible R&D activities. In certain instances, the amount of depreciation notionally allocated to the R&D tax incentive is modified. I do not propose to discuss the technical intricacies, however broadly, where an entity enjoys accelerated depreciation under the small business entity provisions, the accelerated depreciation amount cannot also be included as part of the entity's R&D tax incentive claim. In light of the global pandemic, the federal government announced a raft of accelerated depreciation measures which are largely looking to stimulate the Australian economy. When calculating an entity's R&D tax incentive amount going forward, it is important to highlight that entities, other than small business entities, are eligible to claim both the accelerated depreciation amount and have the accelerated depreciation amount incorporated as part of their R&D tax incentive calculation, thus providing a significant benefit to R&D claimants.
other measures were also amended as part of the 2020 bill. These amendments focused on the tax treatment of clawbacks and improving the integrity of the R&D tax incentive regime. The clawback amendments introduce a new uniform clawback rule that will apply to recoupments, feedstock and balancing adjustments. The integrity of the R&D tax incentive regime has been further strengthened by providing the Commissioner with the ability to apply Part 4A to schemes that have been specifically designed to enable entities to access a R&D tax incentive offset. I will now be handing over to Janet, who will be discussing record keeping, governance and overseas findings. Thanks, Maria. Normally, R&D activities should be undertaken in Australia to claim the national R&D tax deduction on the expenditure incurred. However, if an entity receives a positive overseas finding from OS industry, expenditure incurred in relation to R&D activities undertaken overseas can be included in the national R&D tax deduction. In order to receive this overseas finding, the entity needs to meet four criteria. Firstly, the overseas activities should be eligible R&D activities meeting the criteria as discussed by Maria. Secondly, the overseas activity should have a significant scientific link to the Australian core activities meaning the Australian core R&D activities cannot be completed without undertaking the overseas activities. Thirdly, the overseas activity cannot be conducted in Australia, either because the undertaking of the activity in Australia would contravene quarantine legislation or due to a specific item not being available in Australia, which include facilities, equipment, living things, and geological features. Lastly, the expenditure incurred on the overseas activities should be less than the expenditure incurred on the related Australian R&D activities. The overseas finding application should be submitted to OS industry before the end of the first income year of undertaking the activities. If approved, the overseas finding will be enforced from the start of the income year in which the application is made. When applying for an advance overseas finding, it is important that all documentation supporting the application has been maintained as a detailed review of the application will be done by OS Industry. OS Industry will most likely ask questions and request further information and documentation before making a decision. The overseas expenditure cannot be included in the national R&D deduction on the tax return until a positive finding has been received from OS industry, which is different to the self-assessment process of the R&D registration application. Even though the advance overseas finding is binding on the Commissioner for only three years, if the activities do not change significantly, the advance overseas finding may last for the duration of the activities. If, however, the overseas expenditure incurred is incidental in relation to the overall R&D claim, the entity can include the overseas expenditure in its notional R&D tax deduction without obtaining an overseas finding. For example, Expenditure incurred for staff members to attend an overseas seminar relating to the R&D project will most likely be incidental in relation to the overall R&D claim. The travel and overseas seminar expenditure can be included in the notional R&D tax deduction without obtaining an overseas finding. In general, R&D entities need to meet the buy or for rules to be able to claim the R&D tax incentive. This essentially means that the R&D entity should own the know-how, IP or similar results of the R&D activities undertaken. The R&D entity should have appropriate control over the undertaking of the R&D activities. And the R&D entity should bear the financial risk of conducting the R&D activities. However, where an eligible Australian R&D entity or a permanent establishment in Australia conducts R&D activities for one or more related foreign corporations, the Australian entity does not need to meet the buy or for rules to claim the R&D tax incentive. 
This means that there is no requirement for the IP to be held in Australia, so the IP can be held by the overseas entity. The overseas entity may also fund the R&D activities conducted on their behalf in Australia. For this exemption to the buy or fall rules to apply, certain conditions will need to be met. The foreign entity should be a resident for tax treaty purposes of a country with which Australia has a double tax agreement in place. All R&D activities should be undertaken in Australia. The R&D entity cannot conduct activities overseas and apply for an advance overseas finding. The foreign entity must be affiliated with the Australian entity or connected with the Australian entity through at least 40% control. The R&D activities must be conducted under a binding written agreement between the Australian R&D entity and the foreign corporation. Written evidence is, however, sufficient in case of a permanent establishment, due to a permanent establishment being legally part of the overseas body corporate and an entity cannot have an agreement with itself. Transfer pricing measures from both financing and contractual arrangements between the foreign entity and the Australian entity should be kept in mind as the transfer pricing rules may reduce the value of the R&D tax offset. The regulators have increased their audit and review activities in recent years in relation to R&D applications lodged and R&D expenditure claimed in tax returns. Many audits and reviews that were unsuccessful were due to insufficient documentation maintained by the R&D entities. It is a legislative requirement to maintain appropriate documentation to substantiate both the R&D activities as well as the related expenditure. The regulators will continue with undertaking audits and reviews, even post-COVID, to ensure all R&D claims made are robust and are meeting this legislative requirement. Even though guidance has been released by the regulators regarding the type of documentation that should be kept by entities, the regulators have not specified the specific format of the documents. As a minimum, the document should address the following the state of the art before commencement of the R&D activities, what was done to determine the state of the art, and why it is not sufficient. In other words, the documents need to address why it is necessary to undertake the R&D activities. It should also address the hypothesis to be tested through the experiments to be undertaken and how the R&D criteria have been satisfied. That is the experimental nature of the core activities, the new knowledge that will be generated and what was not known at the outset of undertaking the experimental activities. The document should also address the nexus between the R&D expenses claimed in the tax return and the activities undertaken. Specifically, the technical documents that may be provided to us industry can include evidence of the literature searches undertaken and the results thereof. It can also include project planning documents, design records and progress reports, records of the experimentation undertaken including the failed experiments, meeting minutes and email correspondence. Documents that may be provided to the ATO in relation to the R&D expenditure claimed can include contracts or agreements entered into with third parties, timesheets, invoices and bank statements for proof of payment. The documentation should be maintained contemporaneously, meaning that you should generate the evidence at the time of conducting the R&D activities. If the regulator determines that the documentation is insufficient, it might result in amendments to the amount claimed in your tax return, with potential penalties and interest applied as well as a potential repayment of the refundable tax offset received, if applicable. In order for you to enhance the likelihood of a successful outcome during an audit or review, it is important to ensure that good governance processes are in place. This includes having robust business systems, proper planning methods and strong record-keeping processes. This will also ensure proper tax management and enhance your innovation capability. I will hand back to Ollie now. Thanks, Janet. I support your comments that record keeping and good governance will be important, not only in the R&D context, but generally for small and medium business enterprises, as the ATO looks to drive its next 5,000 compliance program 
into the privately owned group sector. So where, that, where does that leave us today? In terms of how PP can assist, I can broadly describe that as follows. Firstly, together with your specialists and our experts, we can help determine whether the key eligibility threshold for claiming the R&D tax incentive will be satisfied in the event of review by Oz Industry. So we can help to ensure a more robust claim is submitted with Oz Industry. Similarly, we can help calculate your R&D expenditure and caution you on the items of expenditure that may attract the eye of the ATO and the associated documentary evidence that would be required to support any such claim. We can tailor our assistance with, in, with regard to the lodgement of documents with Oz Industry and the ATO. So whilst we prefer to un undertake the complete support process, we have conducted reviews and spot checks for clients to give them a, a level of assurance before they self-lodge their claims as well. We can advise on structuring matters relevant to a new R&D activity or to a new venture relating to R&D. And finally, we can provide support and advice around the documentation and governance practice, practices that we have just uh, covered. So with that, I would like to thank both of our presenters today, Maria and Janet, for their time and sharing their experience. I hope you have all found it useful and we would welcome the opportunity to receive your questions, as I have said at the outset whether that's through your usual PP contact or via the email addresses located at the conclusion of this slide presentation. Thank you all for your attendance.